Wait a minute. Great. So, um, can I welcome you all uh, very warmly to this meeting in the 193rd year of uh, NHSN's existence. This is now our third annual meeting that we've held on Zoom. Um, and it's really good to see everybody here. Um, I think the last two years I've <laughs> said that next year, we really nice to see you in person. This year, I'm making no predictions at all about what may happen in the future. Um, so anyway, never mind. It's, it's, it's very good to, to see you all. And um, uh, you will see what, what we have in prospect uh, tonight. It won't be very long, I don't think, but um, yeah, hopefully everyone will get something out of it. Um, now I will introduce those others of us on the call who are going to be uh, speaking. Mm -hmm. And uh, James has helpfully got this slide, which uh, shows all those people who we are, we are expecting to, to speak. And you can see there names and pictures. Right. So uh, now we will move on to the formal part of the meeting. Um, and the first item is to the consideration of the report and accounts for last year, the financial statements and the annual report um, for the period 1st of October. 1st of August 2020 to 31st July 2021. And uh, hopefully you will all have received um, a summary of the uh, in the annual review, uh, which was sent with the winter edition of the Northeast Nature, which you should have received. Yes. And the full financial statements and accounts, which are like this, have been available on the NHSN website. Um, and have also been available from the NHSN office. So that's what we are considering at the moment. Uh, the annual review sets out uh, our summary and my uh, review of the um, uh, transactions during the, during the last year. Uh, so just I'll briefly summarize, summarize that um, just to say that well, it's been a challenging year, obviously, but we've had another successful year, notwithstanding the continuing pandemic and lockdowns. And we've been learning to adapt to new circumstances and the new challenges and opportunities that that has presented. We've had major improvements at Gosforth's Nature Reserve, including the building of our new field studies room. It's been frustrating not to have proper access to our offices and our library and archive in the museum, but we have further significantly embraced digital technology and increased our digital activities again. Um, and in the presentation that will come a bit later on, we'll hear much more detail about what has been happening last year and for what's going to happen in the future. But just for the moment, uh, it's down to me to say a huge thank you to um, you and all our members and our volunteers and staff uh, whose support has been absolutely crucial in carrying us through this period. So thank you very much. So let us now consider the financial figures. And for this, I'm going to hand over to our treasurer, Brian Cram, who will uh, briefly summarize the situation for us. Over to you, Brian. Thanks, Jonathan. <clears throat> uh, as Jonathan said, the, the full statement is available online, but it, it's quite a, uh, a large document. So I'll just go through some of the highlights, which I think are worthy of note. Um, during the year, the subscription income increased from 61,000 to 73,000, which was a very good result. Um, our income from investment actually dropped slightly uh, from 21 to 17, but 
that basically reflects the market performance throughout the year. Um, the investments, uh, we hold an investment portfolio basically to generate an annual, annual income to help fund the work. Um, and it actually increased in value over the year. Um, but to be honest, that was mostly because of the impact of the pandemic. Because the prior year, we saw a huge uh, reduction because of COVID. And this year, it actually recovered quite a bit. Um, so anyway, it was quite healthy at the end of the year. It recovered to 696,000. Um, and that was despite us selling 75,000 pounds worth of shares to fund the construction of the new field studies room. So the, the portfolio did quite well. <clears throat> uh, total expenditure exceeded that of the previous year, but it was pretty much spot on to the forecasted the budget, which was very good. Um, the main reasons for the increases were uh, staffing, communications, and membership support, all, all part of the towards 2029 projects. Um, another thing to note is we did receive a large local enterprise partnership grant, which is counted as income in this year. However, most of that, most of the expenditure would to which that relates was actually of a capital nature. Um, so you won't really see that hit the accounts until we release it in the form of depreciation over the next 10 years. So if you like, the accounts kind of flatters us slightly. Um, capital expenditure on fixed assets, we spent 168,000 uh, pounds. Uh, of which 167,000 were constructions at GNR and only was an extra 1,000 on laptops for home working during the pandemic. Uh, cash at the bank dropped from 228,000 to 48,000. Again, that was uh, in accordance with plan. Um, so this cash movement, together with the sale of shares, the 75,000 and grant income of 98,000, Basically, that we use that to fund the towards 2029 projects. Um, <clears throat> as I said, the share portfolio actually benefited um, from an unrealized gain of 107,000. That's basically, if we sold it off today, that's the paper profit we would make. But again, that's just really the, the contra to the loss that we had last year through the COVID. Um, reduction. Um, free reserves fell from 206 to 128,000. Again, that was as planned. Uh, free reserves basically are unrestricted funds that are readily available. And it tends to be, that's what a lot of um, issuing authorities look at immediately when they consider whether we are worthy of a grant or not. So the free reserves fell to 128,000 which equates to approximately six months unrestricted expenditure. And this is pretty much spot on in line with our policy on reserves. Uh, that's kind of a summary. As I said, there's huge detail in the financial statements, but that's it in a nutshell. So you are welcome to receive any questions if you have them now. If not, I'll pass back to Jonathan. Yeah. Well, there is a question from uh, on the chat from uh, Julia, uh, which is saying, how has membership changed in the last 12 months? Uh, and it looks like donations is that memberships have increased. Um, if you, yeah, if you look, the donations has increased, um, but the donations, in that figure, we actually include grant income as well. Um, so I don't have the actual membership numbers, but I can say, um, last year it was 61,000 pounds. This year we received 73,000 pounds. 
So it's quite a significant increase. So we, we do seem to um, a manage to capture new members and B, we also seem to have a very good retention rate on existing members. So you, you're probably looking at a, what was that, about a 15% increase, something like that. And that's purely on numbers because the membership rate hasn't changed. Oh, to be honest, I can't remember when, it must be about three or four years. So that's purely on numbers of members. Thanks, Brian. Uh, does anyone else have any, are there any more questions on the, on the accounts themselves, on the figures or any more queries for Brian? Um, I can't see everybody, but I'm, I'm, anyone speak if they, if, they, if there are any questions they want to ask. If not, um, then uh, I, uh, would propose that we, uh, uh, I propose that the accounts, uh, the financial statements and the uh, annual report for last year are approved. And uh, Brian, will you second that? I will, yes. Uh, so we need to uh, vote on whether we approve that or not. And you should see, Claire has kindly put up the poll that says, do you approve the financials? Do you support the approval of the financial statement and annual report? If you could click yes and no, and then press the submit button down the bottom, that would be very helpful. Um, I don't know. That, 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 that looks like that looks like like everybody. Uh, we've got twenty five out of twenty six, but I, I haven't cast a poll. So, right. would you like me to share share the results now, Jonathan? Well, why not? Yes, it sounds good. Well, that looks good. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for that. That's that's very helpful. So uh, we now move on to the next item on the agenda. Next slide, please, James. Thank you. Um, and just before we deal with this item, perhaps I should just explain that uh, normally um, you, we, at this stage, we would normally be dealing with elections to council and the appoint, uh, election of, new, of trustees to council and the appointment of a treasurer. You might be expecting that. Um, but I should just explain that our trustees, that's members of council, are elected for three year terms. And it just so happens this year that none of our existing 11 trustees have come to the end, are coming to the end of their three year terms. So none of them is, is due to retire this year. And we haven't got any proposals for any new trustees to be appointed. So that's why there's nothing to do with trustee elections. And as far as the election of a treasurer is concerned, uh, last year we changed our constitution so that uh, we didn't have to keep electing the treasurer each year at this meeting, but the election of the treasurer is dealt with by the council um, from uh, at a council meeting from among their members. So that will be dealt with at the next council meeting. Um, I'm anticipating that at the next council meeting, um, council will hopefully uh, re-elect Brian as the uh, treasurer uh, if he is willing to stand uh, I'm hoping hoping that that is the case but perhaps it's appropriate for me here to say thank you to Brian for everything that he does as treasurer and uh, and uh, look forward to you being re-elected <laughs> thank you Brian so uh, that does leave us with the election of our independent examiners who are our current incumbents, uh, MHA Tate Walker. Uh, they are doing a good job. And so I would propose that we continue to uh, use them and re-elect them. So I um, uh, propose uh, that MHA Tate Walker should be re-elected. And Brian, will you second that? We'll second that, yes. We'll second that. And so we need to vote on that, Claire, if you will have just an... We can see everybody. Does everyone approve the reappointment of uh, Tate Walker? Hands up. A any against? 
no. Okay, very good. Uh, they are they are they are deemed to be re-elected. Thanks very much. Uh, sorry, James. We can screen share again. Um, so uh, that um, concludes the very formal part of uh, the uh, meeting. Uh, we we're now going to move to a present a presentation about uh, last year and about um, a look ahead to 2022 and we'll then take questions at the end of that so uh, it's my pleasure now to hand over to Gordon Port our vice chair who is going to lead us into the presentation thank you very much Jonathan um, wow, what a year it has been. Uh, it's been so uh, full of things to do, things to worry about, and lots of things to celebrate. And really, I think top of the list is that thank you to everybody who has supported uh, the Natural History Society through this year, last year. Um, it, it's because the members give us that support that even when we're faced with the challenges that 2021 Brought, we can actually achieve so much. And remember that as the Natural History Society only has a very small staff team, it's the large number of volunteers and that collective effort that gives us all of these things to feel proud about. And so in the next part of the uh, presentation, we're going to be talking about sort of nature conservation and Gosford's Nature Reserve and engagement and so on. And you'll be pleased to know that it's not just me talking, so I'll be handing on to others in a minute. But I'm going to start off talking about uh, some of the citizen science conservation work. So James, if you could change the slide, please. A long time ago, in the first year of the pandemic, 2020, we started uh, the Northeast Bee Hunt. And it was so successful that in the second year we of the pandemic, we ran it again. So in 2021, we ran the Northeast Bee Hunt. And we also had alongside that another citizen science project which was the northeast ladybird spot and our aim was not only to give people lots of interesting things to do to increase our understanding of the distribution and abundance of those groups but also to help people learn more about uh, these insects and to keep recording their observations whether it's insects or any other things and in 2021 those two citizen science projects contributed over 6,000 records from the region and um, we actually involved over 280 different recorders. So I think that's a, a massive achievement when we weren't able to get together that often to do things. If we can move to the next slide, please, James. Uh, this shows uh, conservation work at Embleton Quarry. And the Natural History Society is obviously involved in a lot of different nature conservation projects. And, during the last year, COVID restricted what individuals and groups could do, but we were very pleased that the Society was able to use its Dickinson Memorial Fund to support the volunteers who are working at Embleton Quarry to improve and extend the site. And really, it is an incredibly well worth, uh, a site well worth visiting, so do get a chance when you're out there. I'm now going to hand over to Claire Freeman, of course, the Director of Natural History Society, and she's going to move on with the next slides. Thank you very much, Gordon. As Gordon said, it has been really quite an incredibly challenging, uh, but in, uh, really uh, an amazing year as well, um, in terms of the amount that's been achieved. And I must admit, um, I have the absolute pleasure and privilege on my frequent visits to the reserve um, to see our volunteers hard at work. And I, it's just, I'm so impressed with the amount of the enthusiasm and their commitment there. Um, they're smiling in all weathers. Um, they do an absolutely sterling job for us there. And this year in particular, um, we can certainly give them all a massive pat on the back. Um, they've created a fantastic new entrance way and welcome area just behind Lake Lodge, for those of you that, that know the nature reserve. 
and um, we've got the volunteers here in action um, with Paul, the reserve warden. Um, he's got some homegrown oak and he's constructed the most beautiful uh, oak feeding station at the entrance to the reserve um, and, and a small bird bath area as well. And it's just a, now a lovely woodland entrance way to the nature reserve. But as soon as you step in, you often met um, with a wonderful selection of, of woodland birds to, to watch now, which is, is a, a really fantastic entrance way. Um, we've also been able to have new fencing installed um, to help the security of the nature reserve. It is obviously an increasingly urbanised site, um, and we do fundamentally want to make sure that we're protecting the, the nature reserve as well. And all of this work has really enabled us to be able to improve the all accessibility to this welcome area uh, as, as well. And um, yeah, so if you haven't had a chance to enjoy the nature reserve and improvements yet, um, I, I, I really would encourage you to, to visit. Next slide, please, James. A key feature of the new welcome area is also the new field studies room. So. Interestingly, even before the pandemic, visiting education groups um, way back in 2018 um, kept on telling us that an indoor space um, and the all important toilets and hand washing um, was a, a much needed facilities. So this was very much a key priority in our plan that we adopted on our 190th birthday way back in the summer of 2019. And that was a key priority in the new reserve management plan as well. So as Jonathan said, we were just delighted when we received financial support from the Northeast Local Enterprise Partnership um, to enable us to actually make our dream of having a field study space um, into a reality uh, over the last year. We had contractors called Gilliards actually do the construction of the main building, but there was a huge amount of ground preparation even before the contractors could come onto site that the volunteers did. Um, and again, they really have worked in all weathers. Um, we've had the delights of, of summer site visits, but we've also had fog, hail, um, wind, snow, um, uh, everything that the Northeast could, could, could throw at that, that windy corner of the site. Um, it's absolute credit to the volunteers for working in all those weathers. And the volunteers have been busy, they've been constructing steps, they've constructed the, the wonderful new access ramp that you can see in that top picture there as well. Um, they've been decorating and kitting out the inside of the building uh, and also doing new landscaping area. We'll be creating a, an outdoor learning uh, area as well, just by the stable doors in that image on the bottom right as, as well. And hopefully you can you can see from the, the image on the top right in particular, just how close the field station is to the new entrance on the Salters Lane lay-by. Um, that's um, just the, the Greg's factory, um, just at, almost appearing at the end of the access ramp there. So the great thing about all this new configuration and new facilities is how easy this is gonna be for access to make sure that we're being as inclusive as possible for community and educational groups visiting uh, in the future. Next slide, please, James. We're really pleased as well throughout all the rest of the reserve that once some of the, the, the COVID restrictions were lifted, um, that we're able to increase the volunteer uh, activities again. So volunteers have continued to work hard to protect and manage the nature reserve. And we get such fantastic positive feedback um, from all of the work that the volunteers do. This year in particular has seen a wonderful increase in the number uh, of volunteer rangers that have joined the team. And I think I'm always just really impressed with the, the lovely team spirit which is developing. Um, the, the team have a very active WhatsApp group. Um, they're sharing wildlife sightings, helping each other out on tips and advice. And we have some fantastic intergenerational kind of learning and support that goes on between some of the more experienced members uh, of the team and also quite a few students from university as, as well. Um, and I know we also get to hear a lot of great feedback from visitors to the reserve as to how much they appreciate all the time and dedication from that volunteer ranger team. 
we've really missed out over the last year being able to have uh, active involvement from the education rangers so we are now really working now that we've got the field studies room um, to, to attract more educational rangers um, so that we can really hopefully be prepared for schools visiting this springtime as, as well uh, with fewer restrictions than we experienced last year. And we've also been delighted to have the return of conservation tasks. Uh, we missed all of our woodland work last winter um, and we've been particularly relieved and excited to be able to welcome back the conservation volunteers because over the last year the Forestry Commission and Natural England uh, approved our 10-year woodland management plan which we're now starting to deliver which is a core piece of work for us in the rest of, of the nature reserve. So um, as always, a, a huge, huge thank you to our volunteers there. Next slide, please, James. And the reserve is obviously uh, equally about the wildlife as, as, as well as all, all the people activity that we've seen. And I must admit the wildlife hasn't disappointed us this year, last year either. Even though the reserve is very urbanised and we've done a huge amount of recording, it was great that we, we're still having new species being recorded here. Um, last year, we actually had an increase in our biological recording. Um, so new, new species recorded like this brown hawker dragonfly here. And also great to have the active involvement of a moth group as well. Um, activities are resumed led by, by Mike Cook. Um, and it's a lovely friendly group from the moth group. And again, that they're, they're making new species discoveries as well. And really great that all of that biological recording feeds into ERIC um, or the, 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 the relevant national data scheme as, as well. And certainly wildlife sightings just on a day-to-day -day basis as well. Um, great to have encounters from the new Beck hide. So regular otter sightings there. Um, we have a very active digi photographers group uh, as, as, as well. Um, Bittens returned, which was very much to the delight of, of visitors um, and some starling murmurations as well. Um, so um, yeah, just a, a wonderful, wonderful year of some of the, the renowned favourites of GNR as well as some new species discovered. And I'm now going to hand over to trustee Annie Tindley to continue. Thanks. Thanks Claire, thanks James. Hello everyone, it's really nice to see you all. Um, so so just, just to continue, if I may, um, around more of our social history uh, of natural history projects, um, and obviously with continuing COVID restrictions, um, making face-to-face -face events and, and also just general day-to-day -day access to the library and archive um, difficult. So we were keen to look at different models, different ways in which we could capture the social history of our natural history and have sort of ended up creating a new addition, I suppose, to our archives and and an and understanding of, of the work of the society and, and, and our, our constituents. So um, these images are taken from our Talking Naturally series, which can be accessed on our YouTube channel. Um, and, and these are kind of informal conversations or sort of semi-interviews um, to capture the stories from a whole variety of Northeast naturalists, uh, essentially looking at their inspirations and um, their favorite Northeast kind of nature moments, you know, how they got into, into natural history. And um, so this is a continuing project. So even though pandemic restrictions are kind of moving back and forward, we're, we're continuing with this work. So um, if you'd like to volunteer <laughs> or if you have a suggestion of someone you think we should interview and, and capture for posterity, as it were, um, please do um, get in touch with us. And um, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, James, sorry, I sound like Chris Whitty now, but uh, <laughs> um, so um, this is this is a, another exciting development, um, particularly in terms of uh, increasing the visibility and access of some of our, our collections, our archival and, and library collections. Um, so this year, one of our most important collections in the archive um, was um, added to um, JSTOR, the sector-renowned digital resource. It's probably one of the go-to digital resources internationally and nationally um, for, for all kinds of collections. Um, and um, this has really helped support a wider interest and a wider um, knowledge 
um, of Margaret's work, I should say Margaret um, Dickinson um, and the watercolour collections here. So for example, uh, the Buick Naturalist Club um, has produced a new book on her work, which, which drew on this, on this collection um, heavily, obviously. And if I could have the next slide uh, again, please. James, thank you. Um, and talking a bit more then about visibility and accessibility, um, we've continued to share art and journals um, and, and all kinds of kind of contributions on our social media and through our members magazine, as a few examples uh, you see here. Um, so this either through Northeast Nature, our magazine, or, or, or on our social media accounts, um, 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 we we're able to share these, these images, which our Northeast naturalists have captured their observations of wildlife uh, in a variety of media, past and present, uh, as you can see uh, from these examples. And of course, these continue to add to our archive as well. Um, so I'm going to hand over now to James, uh, our engagement officer. Um, so James, I'll let you come in there. Thanks so much, Annie. Um, yes, just to cover a little bit more of our engagement activities over the last year. I think it's important to say that whilst it was an unpredictable year, it wasn't half as bad as 2020 when it came to face-to-face -to -face engagement. Despite uncertainty, particularly at the start of the year, um, and thanks in such a large part to NHSN's fab specialist groups, this year saw a great programme of field trips despite the pandemic. These included recording activities and surveys linking to our citizen science schemes, including bee hunts on Lindisfarne and Silverlink, but also other trips from Newcastle to Teesdale looking at geology, birds and botany. It was wonderful in particular to have so many Earth Sciences trips this year um, and a big thank you to Carl and Brenda who are, I know are in attendance tonight. Finally, on this front at least, activities at GNR also increased this year thanks to our fantastic volunteers. With everything from butterfly walks to introductory walks with a ranger giving new members a feel for this fantastic place. Not to mention our first ever wild weekend, two days of activities connecting local people with GNR's wildlife, which rather wonderfully saw around 300 people visit the reserve over the two days. But of course, living in the age of COVID, digital remained just as important as ever this year, if not more important in keeping members and supporters up to date with what was going on within NHSN. This year, our NHSN talks stayed digital, sharing the work and research of experts across the UK and close at home in the Northeast, including wonderful talks on sites such as Lindisfarne, as you can see a screenshot of here. Our early career 1829 talks continued with students from three local universities presenting their work and research on an incredible diversity of topics from climate change to botany at Teesdale. Elsewhere, our YouTube channel went from strength to strength. A highlight here was certainly the introduction of a new series of beginner friendly botany videos. Um, and a big thank you to Chris and Hazel Meverell for these watch the space certainly for more to come this year. Working to provide more digital opportunities this year, we also hosted a number of special digital events covering everything from bumblebee identification and ladybirds to the use of wildlife recording apps, including iRecord. And finally, our regular education courses went digital too. A big thank you to NHSN's fantastic course tutors for their adaptability and I'm pleased to say that the feedback from members so far has been overwhelmingly positive. Through 2021, NHSN's publications too continue to improve thanks to many fantastic contributors from across the region and thanks to, in the case of Northeast Nature, Charlotte Ranking acted as editor. The magazine featured more news, research, wildlife sightings from across the region than ever before. This also expanded to include projects and news from partners befitting NHSN's status as a forum for natural history in our region. And continuing a long tradition, two editions of Northumbrian Naturalist were also produced this year. Coastal Wildlife, with a huge degree of thanks to our editor, Chris Redfern, went from strength to strength, featuring new contributors and valuable research into Northeast nature. And we also produced a rare plant register for South Northumberland, a very useful conservation tool when it comes to protecting wildflowers in the future. And I will now hand back to Claire. 
Thanks ever so much, James. Hopefully that's really given you a, a kind of uh, a good overview um, of last year's achievements. Um, so really, despite the challenges of COVID, um, we've really, thanks to a huge collective effort, been able to, to achieve a lot. Um, but I should really just say a huge thank you also to all funders um, and partners as well. Um, last year was one of our most successful years of, of, of fundraising. Um, in the summer, we had a fundraising appeal to actually raise the final £10,000 that was needed for kitting out the field studies room. Um, so a special thank you to any donors on that fundraising appeal. Um, and we were especially impressed with four-year-old Ruben, just pictured in this slide here, uh, who raised uh, uh, about £1,500 with his sponsored bike ride and bird watch. Um, and as a four-year-old member, um, absolutely, uh, we were so delighted and inspired um, with all of his, his efforts. And I think it really just does go to demonstrate that it is just this commitment of just so many NHSN members and volunteers that really help secure all of this funding um, and also the contribution of partners over the last year. So it is just that a huge collective effort, um, but just really, really impressive that we have still been able to deliver so much last year, um, despite all, all of those challenges. So we're now going to just start looking ahead um, to, to 2022. Um, so we're really wanting to continue to build uh, on our long history. Um, as Jonathan said at the start, this is our 193rd year as well. Um, and we really be wanting to make sure that we're responding to both the challenges and the opportunities of today. Um, obviously, most notably of the pandemic, um, but also climate change and biodiversity emergency as well. Next slide, please, James. Thank you. So today we're excited to be launching with you um, our, our new three-year plan. So um, it doesn't seem that it was uh, only two years ago that we'd actually adopted our 10-year strategy towards 2029. Uh, we were due to be looking at that and giving it a refresh after three years this summer. But in actual fact, last summer, we thought we should really bring that forward um, because of the pandemic um, and a few other agendas changing, really, that, that we wanted to make sure that we were really keeping up to date. So we had a number of workshops involving trustees, uh, volunteers and staff, um, really giving us a great opportunity um, to just make sure that we are still staying relevant. We absolutely want to be really ensuring um, that we're building on all of our future, of, of our past work, um, our long history, um, as, as well as addressing challenges of the future. So our key vision is about enabling more people and also a wider range of people to enjoy, understand and protect Northeast nature. And I think obviously, I'm sure many of you have been watching the latest David Attenborough programme, keeping up to date with some of the climate agenda as well. And it does feel as though the need to inspire more people has actually never been more urgent um, in this, 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 this long history that the society has. So we have set an overall ambition to reach and inspire nature among 25,000 people a year um, for the next three years as, as well. Next slide, please, James. Thank you. Mm. A new year three year plan uh, is a natural evolution of our last plan. Uh, we didn't want uh, to waste any of that effort of, of the 10 year strategy that we'd worked up before. And this really is um, just developing our ambition further and really emphasizing that focus on the climate and ecological emergency. So our focus going forward for all NHS and activities will be about focusing and celebrating on northeast nature, really celebrating the region's wildlife and wild places. We want to raise awareness of the challenges and the opportunities for all to respond to the climate and biodiversity emergency. And really a key emphasis of that is taking an approach that everyone's a naturalist. So we want to be supporting people to notice and protect nature wherever they are in, in Northeast England. As Gordon mentioned earlier, 
last year we, we were able to really uh, develop our citizen science programme. Um, and I'm delighted to say that uh, uh, this springtime, we're gonna be launching uh, another citizen science project. Um, this will be running alongside bees and ladybirds projects in 2022. Um, and that's gonna be discovering orchids. Orchids are obviously a group whose range has, has been under-recorded and also changes uh, in their distribution aren't fully understood. Um, so it felt a, a really key group for us to, to focus on. Across the region, we have 28 orchid species occur, but we will um, in particular be focusing on seven spotlight species um, in the new citizen science project, um, including the familiar bee orchid and northern marsh orchid pictured here. Um, but certainly all records um, will be welcomed uh, as well. Throughout the next three years, we will very much be further developing our citizen science projects. Um, and also we'd really like to be extending um, the numbers uh, and hopefully encouraging some beginner recorders to be inspired in citizen science so that we can reach more people um, and capture more records going forward into the future. Next slide, James. We're really wanting to, to build on our, our digital and our face-to-face -face engagement. So continuing to build on the program of opportunities to learn. Um, we want to be making sure we're, we're having a good range of events across the region and welcoming all levels of interest um, in all aspects of, of natural history, um, working uh, across our, our specialist groups, um, including earth sciences as, as well. Um, and great to see so much interest in the specialist groups developing, um, both the events and the field trips, the digi events online, and the education courses continue to expand those. In the next three years, we'll also look to increase the grants from the Dickinson Fund so that we can hopefully enable more members to take action locally uh, to protect nature. I'm also looking to further develop our outreach to young people to provide opportunities to experience nature with an expanded programme with the Lantern Fund. I'm also looking to improve the accessibility and increase the use of the library and archive collections at the museum. Um, we were all itching to get back in, in December and then really disappointed um, that with increasing restrictions, um, we've had to put back the return of, of, of our, our great volunteers to the library and archive for the moment. So we really hope that we'll be able to make great strides there this year and then to build on that in the next three years as well. Next slide, please, James. And obviously we will be continuing um, the further developments at the Gosforth Nature Reserve as well. So with the fact that the field studies room is, is almost completed now, uh, we're starting to collate contacts um, at a whole range of local schools and community groups. And our plan there for this year and then for the next couple of years as well to continue is to have very much a proactive program of inviting schools and community groups. Uh, we're going to have a more proactive approach to student research projects and also look to expand on the student awards scheme. Um, we've had great feedback from students um, of how much that helps develop their skills, that lovely kind of interface of intergenerational learning and to really support students' employability as, as well locally. We'll continue to expand biological recording. We have really active bird ringers group, still continuing to contribute to the, the national and the local recording schemes as well. And also continue to work on the new 10 year woodland management plan. And the emphasis of that is really looking to diversify the species, uh, ages and structure of the woodland. Um, it obviously took quite a hammering in the recent start, Storm Irwin with the, the greatest storm damage that we've had in, in living memory there. Um, but interestingly, there will be some opportunities for other ground floor, I'm sure, to be benefiting from some of those holes punched in the tree canopy uh, as, as well. Um, and then towards the end of the three year plan, um, if we can secure some external funding, we would also like to make some improvements to the Lawrence Hyde, um, where the bird feeding station is just close to the entrance there. 
and we will still continue our active campaigns to protect Gosford Nature Reserve. We do still unfortunately have the threat of the persimmons housing development right opposite the reserve on Salters Lane and we would also like to work to strengthen the wildlife corridor uh, as, as well, recognising how important um, for wildlife the connectivity of the reserve is to the surrounding landscape. Next slide please James. I was absolutely delighted today um, to, to, to welcome our Nature Ranger starting. Um, we were so excited to, to be having uh, funding from the National Lottery Heritage Fund, which is going to enable us to start a, a one year project of how to be a young Northeast naturalist. Uh, so this project, uh, we will be reaching out to 150 local school children, uh, five local primary schools. And we will be working with them to work with the parents, the children and the teachers. And our two nature rangers, Julie and Jack, started this week, um, will work to develop a whole range of activities for the children to be able to discover nature right on their doorstep, close to the schools and close to their home, which they will hopefully be able to share with their families and friends as well. Mm. And then the, the project will culminate in, in us being able to produce a how to be a young Northeast naturalist toolkit that we'll be able to share with a, a lot more schools. This is actual fact um, a project um, funded by the lottery, as I said, uh, that is a development project. So we're delighted to have teamed up with Newcastle University's uh, te Teaching and Learning Centre as our formal evaluator for the project. Um, so we would really like to be able to learn uh, a lot from the children and the teachers um, as we develop all stages of this project to really learn ourselves as to how best we can then work with even more primary school children um, in the future. So um, really exciting part of our history. Um, uh, I must admit, it was great to be able to look in our archive sometimes and look at some of the early work that the creator Tony Tynan did on nature trails. Um, some of the first nature trails developed in the region um, happened at Gosford Nature Reserve way back in the 1950s and 60s. So um, I must admit, when I was showing Julie around the library and archive today, she was super excited at this huge amount of history as someone who's been local to the area um, and been, been teaching for a number of years. And it was just a lovely reminder. We were absolutely like kids in a sweetie shop um, at Christmas. It was just this wonderful excitement of being able to link our rich history and the treasures of, of the library and archive with the wonderful heritage asset that we have at Gosford Nature Reserve to be really sharing that, you know, with children for the future. So I must admit, it just did feel just an absolutely wonderful reminder of just what a kind of wonderful place Natural History Society of Northumbria is. So um, next slide, please, James. So yeah, it was just with all that excitement, uh, just an absolutely huge thank you um, to everyone here this evening and to all of our members. Um, we have really been able to just do so, so much. Um, please do look out um, in future members e-news um, for more, more details um, of the action for Northeast Nature Plan. Um, and we'll be putting the plan soon on our website and further updates as well. Um, but thanks to your support, we've been able to achieve so much and just develop such lovely, exciting and ambitious plans as, as well. So thank you. So I will now just hand back to Jonathan. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Claire. And uh, thank you to Claire, Gordon, Annie and James for that very fascinating and interesting um, presentation, which I learned a lot from, from. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, I don't know now is the time for for uh, anybody to ask questions and um, make comments as they wish. So we'll screen, screen sharing and uh, uh, throw things open to to the floor, as it were. Does anyone have any questions that they would would like to ask? Uh, ask do either raise your hand or well raise your hand at this stage now all right <laughs> i i wanted to ask about 
the use of scientific names, uh, not, not saying Latin names or Greek names or anything, but scientific. In other words, um, the, the lovely article in uh, the last uh, magazine about the bryophytes was a very, very good article about them. But I was disappointed to see that they'd been called by what I might call common English names. Now, the common English names are so very different in lots and lots of different places in England. And in places where I've been, uh, everybody's uh, local names are completely different um, all around the world. We lived in Australia for a while. We've been in different parts of Africa and this sort of thing. And um, if you use the scientific name, then everybody everywhere knows exactly which particular thing you're talking about. And um, I just like to uh, encourage people to do that because the thing is that um, Helen uh, Raper and myself, we've been doing a children's uh, club, um, a nature club at the uh, Whitley Bay um, Garden. And uh, I've been introducing them to the families of flowering plants and this sort of thing because um, even the very young ones can see the similarities and understand the idea of families and giving them family names so that you can um, identify something down to a, a group that it belongs to. Um, and they don't really need to know an awful lot about it, but um, introducing them to uh, floral diagrams and floral formulas at a very early age I think is very good because it gives them the idea of um, plants having a, what you might call it, a home address, uh, mm -hmm. being that the ones that you know, you can put into the group with the other ones that you find in, which are different or the same. And um, I, I think particularly with the children's groups. And the other thing I'd like to ask about is at the new centre um, at uh, Gosford, um, do you have many microscopes and this sort of thing? Right. Uh, uh, thanks, Audrey. For th thanks for your, your first comment. We'll, we'll come on to your microscope question in a minute. But per perhaps yeah. uh, on the question of scientific names, it, it, it's a valid point. Per perhaps, Chris Redfern, you, you'd probably like mm. to comment on, on, on that. Yes. Um, <clears throat> it's a very interesting point. <clears throat> and it does depend, I think, on the audience that a particular piece of writing yeah. is targeted at um but yes no, i think you're, you're quite right that it, it, do, it does also depend on the group of uh wildlife or animals we're talking about i think in uh, northeast nature on an article we probably wouldn't put scientific names of birds in or mammals um because people tend to, to know what they are um, and I completely take your point about things like bryophytes, which are um, yeah. the common names. They're less familiar and may vary a lot. Um, so, so, yes, I think it's something we'll take on board. <laughs> Incidentally, I suppose, with um, for ornithologists, it's actually quite frustrating, actually, because the scientific names recently have been changing a lot more than the common names do. <laughs> And that's just the advent of DNA sequencing and the impact it has on yeah. taxonomy. You blame the taxonomist for that. <laughs> that's right, yes. Yeah, so it's, it's a very good point. I think it's something we'll try and keep uh, an eye on in, in the future and uh, make you. sure we have, well, uh, either have consistency or uh, look at a particular group where it's more important to have scientific names associated with the common names as well. <clears throat> so thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks, Chris, very much. Thank you, thank you, Audrey. And uh, about your microscopes, I, I, Claire, I don't know if you want to uh, um, reply to reply to that. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, in actual fact, it, it's it's lovely um, that we have uh, great links with the university. Um, and um, Gordon, uh, you've been kind of asking around the university as to whether or not there's some microscopes uh, and various other equipment um, that, that we, we can have on, on loan from the university. Um, and we are also in the future, um, we will very much be in discussion um, with our course tutors um, leading educational courses um, at the field studies room as well, so that we can actually gradually build up any equipment that, that is needed. 
um, as, as well. Yeah, thank you all, Drew. If, if there are no further questions, can I just um, formally thank you all very much for um, attending uh, tonight. It's been really nice to see everybody and thank you um, to everybody for, for, um, for everything over the year and for, um, and for, for coming today.